All right. So I would like to uh, welcome everybody to the One World Minds uh, seminar this beautiful Thursday. Um, our speaker today is Boris Hannon, who is an assistant professor in operations research and financial uh, engineering department at, at Princeton. Um, he has uh, among his, his many accomplishments so far an NSF career award to his name uh, and is generally uh, extremely knowledgeable about deep learning, uh, random matrix theory and spectral theory um, writ large. Uh, he's also uh, an editor for Pure and Applied Analysis, um, among his other sort of service duties. So I, we're really happy to have him here today to talk to us about random neural networks. And um, so I will let him take it away from here. Okay, thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Good to meet you all, at least remotely. Uh, so, so I want to tell you all today about a kind of circle of ideas that I've been really excited about for a couple of years, and they have to do with turning random neural networks, in a way I will explain, into what are essentially solvable models. So, so uh, I don't assume you already know what a neural network is, and I'll briefly recall the definition in a moment. But first, let me just emphasize that this is joint work with a number of really phenomenal collaborators. So first of all, there's Dan Roberts and Sho Yaida. So they're theoretical physicists who grew up doing high energy physics and now are in industry doing machine learning theory. Shows at Facebook and Dan is between MIT and Salesforce. And then there's also Mihai Nika, who is a wonderful mathematician who's now at Guelph, uh, who's an expert in random matrix theory and uh, mathematical physics of various kinds. Okay, so, so my plan is like this. I, I wanna take kind of the geodesic route to, to stating the problem I want to solve. And then I'm going to try to step back and give you some motivations and a little bit of intuition for, for why I care. And then I'll state some theorems and, and tell you what the more or less precise results are. So together with Dan and Sho, we wrote a, a physics -y book recently about principles of deep learning theory. So I'll report partly on that book and partly on some ongoing work to make parts of that book more mathematical. And then I'll mention some work with Mihai as well. OK, fine. So, so uh, with that said, let me start with the problem statement. All right. So I have to tell you what a uh, random neural network is for me. And so, so to do that, let's fix some parameters. So let's fix a positive integer L. Let's fix L plus one or L plus two, in fact, positive integers N sub zero through N sub L plus one. And let's pick our favorite potentially nonlinear function sigma from R to R. Okay, and, and so in a moment, these ends will be the widths of the layers in my neural network, and I'll want them to be large, but not too large. So I'm gonna have N1 up to NL be proportional to a large integer N. Okay, so, 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 and then here's the game I want to play once I have all these things fixed. I want to consider a fully connected neural network. And I'll remind you, like I said, in just a second of what that is, okay, uh, which uses all these parameters, which has depth capital L. It has input or output dimensions N0 and L plus one. It has nonlinearity sigma, sigma, and then hidden layer widths. widths, oops, I don't think I know how to spell widths. Here we go, N1 up to NL. Okay, so, so what the heck does that mean? If you've never seen it, you've probably seen some version of it, but let me just remind you. Okay, this, this is a family of maps that starts with an input X from RN0 and produces an output that I'll call Z superscript L plus one of X. So this belongs to RN capital L plus one. And it, it does so by a sequence of uh, relatively simple-minded nonlinear transformations. You do affine transformation, then you apply your nonlinear function sigma at each layer, and they kind of look like this. Okay, so you start with X, and then you return what I will call Z superscript one. This is the vector of pre-activations in layer one. And this, by definition, is just an affine transformation of X. So there's a matrix W1 that acts on X, and then a vector B1 that I add, and this is an RN1. And then I simply keep going. I define the vector of preactivations at layer two, 
to be another matrix W2 applied to sigma of Z1 of X, okay, plus B2, and this is in Rn2, okay, and so on. So, so the game is you apply an affine transformation, then to each component of your vector, you applied your fixed nonlinear function, and you do this L times until you finally just apply an affine transformation without the sigma, and that's the output of your network. Okay, so, so, so uh, in terms of components, and I'm just gonna use this notation in a moment, so I'm gonna emphasize it here. So I'm going to write Z superscript L, and then I'll write subscript I, and evaluate it at X. So, so this will be what uh, people call the preactivation uh, that you get at neuron number I. So it's the ith component of the vector uh, Z superscript L. So in layer uh, L from input X. So, so that's, that's what my uh, indices mean. X is the network input. I is the number neuron, it's the component of the vector, and my superscript L is which layer you're in. Okay, so, so um, and then as the title of the talk suggests, I'm not just interested in studying these in some uh, abstract way, I want to randomize everything. So, so the affine transformations, the Ws and the Bs will be Gaussian and random. So, so that's the, the final thing for setting up the, the notation of the problem. Okay, so I'm going to suppose that these matrices WL and these vectors BL are random. And specifically, I'll take them to have Gaussian independent entries. So WL IJ is equal to, uh, 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 maybe let me write it this way, is drawn from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance CW over N L minus one and BLI the components of these bias vectors are mean zero, variance CB. And, and here, uh, in a way that I'll explain, the CB and CW are constants, which are part of the definition of the model. Uh, and as I'll explain, they need to be chosen eventually, if you want something sensible, to depend on the nonlinear function sigma. Okay, but, but for now, they're just constants that define the model. Uh, I, I, I can do this. Okay, so, so in fact, it strikes me that I should probably write out a component expression so let me, since I'm able to on Zoom, just do that. Okay, so, so let me just say that if you want to see everything in its gory component details, okay, so, so this is the ith component of the bias vector plus the sum on J goes from one to the width of the previous hidden layer. I'm just embarrassingly enough writing out what an affine transformation actually looks like. Okay, Z L minus one J of X. So, so I'm just telling you my notation for the weights and biases of the network. Okay, and then I'm about to state the problem and then I promise I'm gonna stop and ask for questions just to make sure the setup is something that, that is human computable. Okay, so, so here's the goal. This is the problem that I'm trying to solve. I want to compute the joint distribution of uh, this stochastic process, you know, so, so X maps to ZL plus one of X and its derivatives. And I'd like to do so uh, to all orders in one over N. So, so in a way I'm about to explain, there's a very simple limit in which little N goes to infinity, sometimes called the infinite width limit for more or less obvious reasons. And in this limit, everything as I will state is going to be a Gaussian process. And then I would like to go beyond the Gaussian process limit. And I would like to compute the, the finite width statistics uh, of, uh, of, of what this random neural network does. Okay, so, so I will go through all that, but, but that at a high level is what I'm trying to do. I would like to understand what does a random neural network look like without sending uh, the widths to infinity. Okay, so, so let me just pause for a second. And uh, my next step is going to be to give you a couple of motivations for why I care to study such a problem, but I want to make sure that just the definitions are clear. So I see there are some questions. Let's see. Um, okay, so right, so there's a question. A question. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I, I see there's a question by, by Neumann, but why you have to divide uh, the variances by NL minus one. Okay, so, so that, that's a fair question. And, and the way I would describe this is I would say, if you've ever uh, studied random matrix theory, when you have N by N matrices, the natural thing if you have centered entries is to have the variance be one over N. 
And that's just to make sure that the spectrum doesn't go off to infinity and doesn't collapse to zero with n uniformly. So, so it's, it's the right scale to keep the singular values of these matrices to be approximately of order one. So, so that's, that's a good question. Okay, other questions or maybe comments? Let's see. Did you have a question, Mark? No, just um, uh, I can I can handle the chat uh, going forward if you don't want to be bothered by it. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I don't mind either way. is perfectly fine with me. Okay. I, I mean, I because I'm because I have two screens, I, I can look you know right. forward and I yeah. see the chat yeah. naturally appear. So it's, it's not so terrible. Okay. So 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 fine. So so either I'm being extremely clear, which makes me happy, or I'm being extremely unclear, and then there's no saving me, presumably. Um, Okay, so oh, I see another question. Do you want to compute all orders of derivatives? Um, yeah, I want, so, so the question is, do I care about all orders and derivatives and, or all orders in one over n? I want all orders in both. I want arbitrary derivatives, arbitrary orders in one over n. I, I want, I'm greedy, I want the whole game. So, so I'll explain what I can do. Yeah, it's a good question, Perry. All right, so, so, so unless there are more questions, um, let me just go on to saying something about motivations. Uh, so I'd like to offer maybe four motivations, four and a half motivations for why I care to study these things. Uh, okay, so first of all, I won't even write it down because it's a little bit philosophical, but you know, when you have very large objects that you're interested in, so these neural networks tend to be large, the widths are big, there are many, many parameters. It's not completely unreasonable to think that at least certain coarse properties of these objects, even as they're used in practice, could be described by generic properties of their random versions. Okay, so just like random matrix theory was originally invented to study, you know, the level lines of heavy atoms, it's not clear, it's not crazy to think that random neural networks say something about neural networks as they're used in practice, okay, more or less. So, so it's a little philosophical, but I don't think completely crackpot. Okay, but, but let me be a little bit more precise. So, so here's motivation number one for real. So the first thing is I'd like to understand the functional prior, okay, th this is how I'll put it. But you see neural networks at the start of training, when they're actually used in practice, really come equipped with IID uh, weights and biases precisely of the kind of scheme that I'm describing to you. And so, so, so studying the behavior of random neural networks is really studying what is the prior on function space that you start with before you do training. You know, do you start with reasonable functions or not? And, and, and this question has a number of sides to it, as I will kind of allude to, but, but that's a very kind of down to earth motivation, I think, for, for studying random neural networks. Okay, so, so a kind of amplification of the first motivation is that when neural networks are used in practice, there are many, many parameters that you have to tune or choose by hand to actually get them to work. And so, so um, studying random neural networks helps with hyperparameter tuning. So, parameter tuning, i.e. making principal choices for hyperparameters such as, okay, so, so of course the weight and bias variances that goes directly into the model. You might ask, how do they affect the statistics of your network at the start of training? Okay, how to choose the nonlinearity, how to choose the depth, how to choose the widths, but then also how to choose things like the step size, eta is the, the learning rate as it's called in, in, in the deep learning world. Okay, and so on and so forth. And you might try to set these so that at least at the start of training, you have a reasonable model that you're starting with. And then in, in, in particular, being able to set them in an automatic way then helps practitioners not have to do a lot of expensive guess and check. Okay, so, so that's motivation number two for me. Okay, motivation number three is a quite interesting thing that people have been fascinated by um, in the modern machine learning world. And, and that's the kind of following effect, which describes a little bit of what happens with large scale machine learning models, though by no means all of it. Okay, so, so when the number of parameters you have in the model, in this case, the number of weights and biases, it is much larger than the number of data points that you're actually trying to fit. You know, I'm thinking of doing supervised machine learning and having some number of data points in my training data set. So when you're over-parameterized, have way more parameters, uh, kind of degrees of freedom that, than you do equations, data points, then sometimes you're in what's called the lazy training regime. 
you get it's called lazy training or you're approximately in this regime. Okay, uh, i.e. all of neural network training can be thought of simply as linearization around the start of training. Okay, so, so, so what I mean is that instead of training the full nonlinear model, and I'll, I'll state a theorem about this on the next slide, but I'll, I'll get to it. Okay, but instead of training your neural network, what you do is you simply randomly initialize it and you linearize it around the start of training. That results in a linear model by definition. And what you do is you just train the linear model. And in some situations, the, you, the, the kind of limit of neural networks in which you have an infinite number of parameters can really formally be proved to be equivalent to this. And so, so in this way, uh, it's really the start of training. It's really the random neural network that determines all the salient features of network optimization. So you might think random neural networks only tell you things about the beginning of training, but in some situations, they really tell you things about all of training. Okay, that, that's motivation number three. So, so these are kind of, you might say, three machine learning motivations. But, but let me also give you a pure math motivation. My background is kind of in mathematical physics and random matrix theory. Okay, so, so uh, and this motivation basically says that random neural networks are a nonlinear generalization of a model that's much studied in random matrix theory. So, so specifically, if you consider the very special case where sigma is the identity, your bias variance is zero. In other words, your biases are just set to zero almost surely. Your weight variance, this constant CW is one. And I take all the widths of my network and I set them to a single parameter n. Okay, then, then what do I find? Well, the network output, zl plus one of x, is simply a product of l plus one n by n Gaussian matrices. Okay, so, so these w's are n by n matrices. All the entries are mean zero, variance one over n IID Gaussians. And, you know, there are plus infinity papers written about random matrix products in various senses and regimes. Okay, so, so, so in fact, let me take this opportunity to draw what is almost certainly my favorite picture to draw in this world. Okay, so, so to kind of explain what to imagine, so let's put L on the x-axis and think of it as a time parameter. Okay, so, so here the motivation is, I think of this random matrix product as being a dynamical system that's very chaotic that I watch evolve for time essentially equal to L where the time one dynamics is just multiply by an independent random matrix. Everything is very chaotic and that's my model. Okay, so, so uh, on the other side, uh, the interpretation for little n for the matrix size is just the number of degrees of freedom or maybe put another way, the system size. Okay, and, and, and from this point of view, there are two extremely well-studied regimes for random matrix products. Okay, there, there's one regime where you fix the number of terms in your matrix product. Maybe you have one large random matrix. Maybe you have a product of seven large random matrices. And you send the system size to infinity. You send n to infinity. And this is what you might call the free probability regime. Okay, that's what the probabilists call it. And the machine learning people call it the NTK regime. Okay, so, so this is a regime which is uh, basically characterized by less correlation. You know, you get as little correlation as possible. Everything becomes maximum entropy. And indeed, the whole story of free probability is essentially that uh, you can describe things in this limit by the appropriate notion of entropy maximization. Okay, so, so that's a beautiful thing that people have considered quite a bit. But there's the other regime where you fix the, the system size and you let L go to infinity. And this is the regime of the multiplicative ergodic theorem. And this uh, regime has more correlations. This is basically where you study things like Lyapunov exponents of dynamical systems, or in this case, just Lyapunov exponents of random matrix products. Okay, so, so, so these two limits uh, are highly non-commutative, right? I can take n to infinity and I can take L to infinity. And, and the goal, just to kind of drive home the point, is to study neural networks, which are certainly somewhat closer to the free probability world. But you see, the issue is that I, I really need finite size corrections, as I'll emphasize. And finite size corrections, even in the matrix product world to the free probability limit, are not such simple objects. And so, so I, that's going to be the story and really the motivation for studying neural networks that are wide, but not infinitely wide. 
That's how they appear in practice. And many things can only be seen at finite width, as I will try to convince you. OK, so, so that, that's the end of my um, attempt to motivate things. So let me just once again briefly pause before trying to transition to state some theorems. Questions or comments? Okay, so I will assume that there are none, but I will monitor the chat. So, so please put them in there if you have them. So, so let me start by uh, telling you what is known and what is true in what's called the infinite width limit. Okay, so, so precisely what the heck do I mean by this thing? I simply mean you fix the input dimension, the output dimension, and the depth of the network, and you send all the hidden layer widths to infinity. Okay, so, so, so that's what I mean by the infinite width limit. And here, there are basically two theorems I want to state. So the first one is I'll call theorem I infinity. So, so I here stands for initialization. This is the behavior of your neural network at the start of training. Okay, so, so, so this theorem has a kind of illustrious history, it goes back to the work originally of Radford Neal. Then there was some influential work by uh, a group from Google Brain. And then there, there, were, there was lots of intervening work. I, I proved some universality type results for it recently, but okay, this is like, uh, th there are too many papers in the sense to cite here. Okay, so, so here's the basic theorem. So as the hidden layer widths N1 up to NL tend to infinity, the following is true. The distribution of your stochastic process, ZL plus one of X, converges to that of a Gaussian process with mean zero and covariance function that I'll denote KL plus one. Okay, in, in the following sense. So, okay, everyone understands what mean zero is presumably, but uh, let me write it this way. If I take the limit as N1 up to NL go to infinity, and since I told you the limit is a Gaussian process, all I have to do is tell you what the covariance structure is, right? It's a vector valued Gaussian process. There's an NL plus one dimensional thing. So I have to take, tell you the covariance between, you know, the ith component at input X, and I have to tell you that, that and the jth component at input X prime. Okay, so the first statement is that the components are independent of each other. You have delta IJ. And the second statement is that there's this function KL plus one, and it's a covariance function. So you simply evaluated X and X prime, and that's what I mean by a limiting covariance. Okay, so, so first of all, you get a Gaussian process. And second of all, this covariance function KL plus one can actually be determined recursively with respect to the layer. Okay, and for each L, we have, okay, so K, little l plus one of x x prime. So, so this is the covariance of what happens if you sell all the hidden layers up to the lth one to infinity. Uh, looks like this, it's cb plus cw. Those are my weight and various biases, weight and variance biases, excuse me, um, against what I'll denote by the expectation with respect to the previous layers, infinite width covariance kl uh, of sigma evaluated at you know, the preactivation at X, sigma evaluated at the preactivation at X prime. So, so, so this notation means you look at the covariance structure you would have had at the previous layer, and you have these two uh, Zs as being jointly distributed according to the two-dimensional Gaussian from that previous layer's covariance. And then you compute this nonlinear expectation. Okay, it's a Gaussian integral. And you, uh, in this way, can relate what happens for layer L to what happens for layer L plus one. I, okay, I, so, think, so, I think you may have just answered it, but there's a question about <clears throat> the uh, weight still being random uh, Gaussians, I expect in the chat. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, thank you for pointing me to that. Okay, exactly. Um, okay, so, so I didn't look at questions in a second. Indeed, so, so, so for me, the, the assumptions, unfortunately that's the downside of a slide talk are, are standing assumptions from the previous slides all the weights and biases are IID Gaussian. Um, okay, independent Gaussian more precisely with the appropriate weight and bias variances 
and the scaling that I had in the previous slide. Yeah, thank you for the question. So indeed, you, you have now this sequence of stochastic processes indexed by the width of the network. You let the width go to infinity and you ask what's the limiting process and I'm telling you it's a Gaussian process with the structure that I just described. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Okay, so, 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 so this is great. This is a beautiful result. And it shows that although neural networks are extremely complicated seemingly, and we're adding more and more and more neurons, so it seems like we add more complication, actually in the infinite width limit, they somehow de degenerate. Okay, so, so here's a kind of simple corollary of this. So, so, so this corollary, um, let me attribute to a nice paper of Schoenholtz. Schoenholtz, there should be an N there. Uh, this was developed, you might say, more completely in, in the book I alluded to that I wrote with Dan and with Sho uh, recently. Okay, but, but the point is the following. You, you can think of this equation that I just wrote here, let me call it pound, just so I can refer to it in some way, as a nonlinear recursion that tells you the structure of your neural network at layer L plus one in terms of the structure at layer L when the width is very large. That's the kind of thing you can think of. And so what, what you can then do is you can use pound uh, to set CB and CW so that KL of X, X prime is well-behaved at large L. Okay, so you see the recursion depended, of course, on the weight and bias variances that I had. Okay, and, and a fact that I, I will not sort of explain in all its details is that if you want a network to actually be trainable, you have to select CB and CW in a certain way if you want L to be large. Otherwise, things will be exponentially small or exponentially large as a function of L, and you'll simply run into numerical instabilities. Okay, so this was a practical thing that recovers things you might have heard of. You know, there's the he initialization for ReLU. So when sigma is ReLU, you get CB equals zero, CW equals two. If, you, if sigma is hyperbolic tangent, you recover CB equals zero, CW equals one. And that's the traditional initialization people learned to use historically for the hyperbolic tangent and so on. Okay, so this is kind of a, a, a concrete thing that you learn more or less in practice. Okay, but, but now let me uh, fast forward to what I had alluded to before. So, so you can go beyond initialization in this infinite width limit, and you can try to explain. I see there's a question, which I'll get to in just a second. Okay, maybe I'll get to it now because I can't help myself. Is the subscript on Z in the last sign supposed to be a one? Yeah, it just means take the same component in the previous layer. Otherwise, they would just be independent, mean zero. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter which subscript you took. So I know it can be a little hard to read when I'm writing. I'm trying to scrunch a lot in. So thank you for the question, Barry. Okay, okay. So, so, so let me state what is uh, a really great theorem, I think. So I'll call it theorem O infinity. This is a theorem about optimization of infinite width networks. And let me attribute it. Again, there's a long line of work. There are several. Okay, there was the seminal paper of do it all. Uh, that was very early on. Then there was the very well-known paper of Jaco et al. And then, okay, a semi-infinite number of papers that came after. Okay, and, and if you were to summarize them, they just say this. If the loss that you're minimizing is the mean squared error, uh, then as the width of the network goes to infinity, you can just replace Z L plus one of X. Okay, and here I'll emphasize that there's a, a, a parameter vector theta. So, so this theta is the vector of parameters of your network, i.e. the vector of Bs and Ws, right? They're the actual trainable parameters of your network that you're going to try to set to some particular value to match some data set of inputs and outputs. So, so, so when people say optimization, they mean change theta. So, so you can replace the neural network that you get by the following uh, linear gadget, I'll call it Z L plus one linear of X and theta, okay? Which by definition just looks like this. It's the value you got at initialization, theta of zero, okay? Plus the gradient you got at initialization. So theta of zero is my initial guess. Theta of zero is literally speaking IID or independent Gaussian weights and biases in the way that I'm describing. Okay, times theta minus theta naught. So you see that we've, as advertised before, quite literally linearized our model 
around the point of initialization. And I'm saying, not, you know, not only is it that you just get this nice Gaussian prior at the start of training, for gradient-based optimization with mean squared error, in fact, for all of training, you just get a linear model. That's, 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 that's a theorem. Okay, so, so this is a beautiful thing. It's a kind of shocking simplification. It says that you thought neural network training was extremely complicated, and at least in the infinite width limit, at least with this initialization I have, at least with mean squared error, okay, there are some important caveats here. Um, but at least in this setting, really all of training is easy. You're simply optimizing a linear model and really no one can stop you from just writing down the answer. At least in principle, if you knew the eigenfunctions of the associated kernel, you know, the associated kernel is just this matrix times this matrix transpose, this Hessian, oh, excuse me, this Jacobian. People call that thing the NTK, but it doesn't matter. So this is called the NTK regime. Okay, so, so, so this is quite a beautiful result. Um, but, but, you know, let me temper my enthusiasm a little bit by just saying that this result is too good in the sense that it's true, no doubt. But perhaps the most important thing about neural networks is that they are not linear models. They actually learn data dependent nonlinear features that can then be used for downstream tasks. That's what people call transfer learning. And the whole point is that, you know, the Jacobian you use, i.e. the NTK that you use, the kernel you use to actually do your kernel regression is determined by initialization. It knows absolutely nothing about the data. Okay, so, so the big problem is there's no feature learning possible. So, so that's really sad. Um, and, 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 and moreover, I would say also, that the role of L of the depth parameter is kind of made moot. This is true for every fixed L. And, and yet, you know, they call the field deep learning for a reason, because somehow making the networks deeper, at least up to a point, seems to be really important. And in this analysis, well, sure, the depth influences somewhat the structure of the kernel that you're using to do regression, but it's not a very transparent or, or really even a very exciting thing that seems to be happening. So, so what I would say is that the infinite width limit is a beautiful starting point for analyzing neural networks, and it already explains many interesting things about them. However, you really have to go to finite width corrections in order to see some of the most important properties of what neural networks actually do, namely the fact that they learn features and the fact that the depth plays some kind of role. So, so I'm about to try to state some new theorems that tell you what finite width neural networks look like and what kind of lessons we can learn. So, so this is kind of more of the new results. But again, let me just pause for one second and see if there are questions or comments at this point. Okay, so seems not. So let me plow on ahead. All right, so, so, so over here, I want to contrast the results on the left with what happens when you study finite width networks. Okay, so, so by finite width, uh, just to recall, I mean all the hidden layer widths, again, are proportional to a single large parameter n, but I'm not going to send n to infinity. So, so if you want, I'm, I'm about to do perturbation theory around the limiting Gaussian process that you get. And I'm going to study what happens to the one over n corrections, the one over n squared corrections, and so on, as a function of the network depth. And we're going to learn a bunch of cool things about that. It's like studying finite size corrections in random matrix theory, you know, when you're trying to understand what happens, not just in the limit as the matrix size goes to infinity, but how quickly things are concentrating, and so on. That's a kind of beautiful subject in its own right. All right, so, so, so let me state the first result. I'll call this theorem. I n, so this stands for initialization at finite width n. Okay, and so 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 this theorem I should attribute, okay, partly to my ongoing work, which is about to be finally posted, uh, that makes the book or parts of the book mathematical that I'm right that I wrote with Show and with Dan. Um, a bunch of it is in the book with Show and with Dan, and some of it is joint with Mihai Nika. Okay, so 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 at a net at the start of training. That's how. People refer to the fact when all the weights and biases are really random. Um, we get the following structural results first. So I'll state a bunch of results, but let me start with this. So let me just introduce a kind of rough notation 
So let me write kappa sub 2k of L. Okay, so what, what the heck do I mean? So this for me is the 2k cumulant of this stochastic process, ZL of X. So, okay, what, which 2k cumulant do I mean? First of all, I'm not studying the odd cumulants because they vanish by symmetry. So only the even ones are interesting. And what I really mean is you look at the finite dimensional distributions of your process. In other words, for example, the values of some number of output neurons at some different inputs and maybe some derivatives of, of those things. That's a finite dimensional vector. And I told you that in the limit, such a thing is a Gaussian. And now I'm studying the higher cumulants, which account for the non-Gaussianity. Okay, and, and the first structural result is that all these cumulants satisfy a nice estimate, namely they go to zero, like one over n to the k minus one. That's the order of magnitude um, of the size of these cumulants as the width becomes large. Okay, and this kind of makes sense. You know, when k equals one, you get the second cumulant also known as the covariance, and that doesn't go to zero. That survives in the infinite width limit, you get a non-degenerate Gaussian. But then I'm saying the first interesting correction to the Gaussian distribution is actually the fourth cumulant. And the next most interesting correction in some sense is the sixth cumulant and so on. Okay, so, so, so let me try to summarize this result in a slightly different language. So we can look at the characteristic function of uh, you know, one of these neurons, for example. So you fix your favorite input X and you just ask, for instance, what's the distribution of the random variable, which is the value computed by the first neuron in layer L. Okay, so, so uh, what I'm saying is the characteristic function, which I'll evaluate at a dual variable that I call C, looks like this. Okay, so I get X of, all right, so, so the first bit we already know. So this is KL2 C squared. So here KL2 is nothing more than the infinite width covariance that I got over here. And if this were the end of the story, this would just say that the distribution is exactly Gaussian. That's, that's the leading order piece. Okay, but then I'm saying that the first order correction that's next is one over N times the normalized fourth cumulant times C to the fourth. Okay, plus I get one over N squared times the normalized sixth cumulant times C to the sixth plus and so on. Okay, so, so I'm saying this is a structure theorem for the distribution I'm only writing it here for a single value of the network output at a single input, just for simplicity. But it holds for any number of inputs, any number of derivatives, whatever you want. This result is extremely robust. Okay, and, it, and, it, and it identifies you know, how important the second cumulant is, how important the fourth cumulant is, and so on. So, so that's kind of cool. Okay, but the results go much further. So, so not only do you get order of magnitude estimates, but just like we had a recursive description for the second cumulant at layer L plus one, in terms of the second cumulant at layer L, you get a recursive description for all the cumulants. Okay, so you get away, get recursions uh, for K L plus one to K via the cumulants at the previous layer, 2J with J less than or equal to K. Okay, so, so if you know these things in mathematical physics, there are these hierarchies in which what you do here is you first solve the top level of the hierarchy. That's the recursion for the infinite width covariance. And then once you do that, you can solve the recursion for the fourth cumulant because the fourth cumulant at layer L plus one is determined by the second cumulant at layer L and the fourth cumulant at layer L. And once you solve that, you can get the sixth cumulant and you can start solving these recursions and understanding what is the structure of the neural network uh, at different orders in one over N. Okay, so, so let me just uh, make this precise by giving you one example of such a recursion, just so you get a sense of what the heck I mean. Okay, so, so the fourth cumulant at layer L plus one looks like this. It satisfies the recursion of the form CW squared over NL times the variance with respect to the uh, infinite width Gaussian of sigma squared of Z. Okay, plus this funny constant CW over two times the expectation, again, the infinite width Gaussian expectation of the second derivative of sigma squared of Z times the fourth cumulant at layer L. Okay, plus lower order terms. So you see that this term is order one over N. 
Uh, this is the fourth cumulant at layer L plus one. This is the fourth cumulant at layer L. And this thing I alluded to, uh, this corollary about finding a good critical, as it's called, initialization for your network, what it comes down to in the end is this constant will be equal to one at criticality. Okay, so criticality is some way of choosing CW and CB so that they depend on sigma and coefficients in various recursions are equal to one. So you get algebraic growth rather than exponential growth for various quantities. Okay, so, so, so that's pretty cool. And what I'm saying is once you have a recursion, you can't help yourself but solve it, right? So, so let me write this down and then I'll stop for a moment and ask for questions before I continue. Okay, so, so actually solving these recursions yields the following really interesting result. I think it's interesting. Okay, so KL 2K, the 2K cumulants, the way they grow is there's some constant which depends on k and the nonlinearity sigma and the exact derivatives that you are taking and so on. And you see over here, I told you that the order of magnitude is one over n to the k minus one. In other words, the higher cumulants became less and less important for describing the distribution of the neural network. But actually you see that the depth strikes back, okay? Much like in Star Wars, so actually they grow like L over N to the power K minus one. And so, so while things seem to be more and more suppressed in powers of one over N, they actually become more and more important if the depth is relatively large. And you cannot see such effects at infinite width because there you fix L and you send N to infinity first. Okay, so, so I should be a little clear. So, so this uh, theorem or this version of the theorem that I'm staying it's kind of a physics theorem. This is what we proved in the book by kind of physics -y methods. And then I don't know how to prove this completely precisely mathematically yet. I can just do the calculations by hand for the fourth, the sixth, and the eighth cumulant. And I get that indeed they grow in the right way with right powers of L over N. Okay, so, so it's still an open problem for me and I'm not sure how to actually do it in a very careful way. Um, okay, let me pause for just one second before I state just one more result in this direction and try to sum up what this first theorem is saying, because this is kind of the end of the structural results, just about the, the cumulants of uh, the random neural network. Questions or comments? Oh, I see a question here. So what is the character next to sigma squared inside the expectation? What is the character? next to sigma squared of z inside the expectation. Ah, uh, I think you're asking about um, what is this down here? So, okay, that is a poorly written KL. So let me try to rewrite it in a sensible way. So this is KL. And what this means, my notation is, sigma is a Gaussian with mean zero and the variance that you had at the previous layer and what you do is you compute the variance of the random variable, which is sigma squared evaluated at that Gaussian. Okay, that's some interesting thing. Uh, Boris, I think he's referring to the derivative and, and the inside the expectation. Oh, 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 that's also possible. So this just means second derivative with respect to Z for me. Yeah, that's a del. It's a partial derivative with respect to Z. Okay, so I said there's another question. This is a non-asymptotic result. Do you still recover? Yeah, so certainly you recover the result when n goes to infinity. Okay, so let me answer that question first. Um, you see here, if you fix L and you let n go to infinity, all of these terms will go to zero in your characteristic function. They all are suppressed by various powers of one over n. And all you're left with is the statement that the limiting characteristic function is e to the minus something times c squared. And that is the statement that you in fact get a Gaussian. So. Okay, very good. And then another question, can you get the L infinity result? Oh, well, okay, the question disappeared. I don't yeah, know. I, think, I think it was the same question. <clears throat> oh, okay, great, great. Yep. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, so just to, just to kind of clarify, the results on the left are you fix L and you let N go to infinity and the constants can depend arbitrarily on L. And what I'm saying is when you actually ask how do they depend on L, you get this beautiful answer. Okay, I think it's beautiful that it's really not L that measures, you know, what's going on. It's, it's this ratio of L over N, you know, so, so L and N fight each other, just like you saw in the kind of 
uh, non-commutative dynamical system story. You know, longer time dynamics fight increasing number of degrees of freedom, and there's some double scaling limit that is naturally suggested. Okay, so thank you for the questions. Keep asking them, please. Um, okay, but but let me state. Um, I see there's one question, but let me state one thing because I really want to get it off my chest, and then I promise I'll answer the question. So 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 more things can be calculated once you have access to the cumulants. You know, you can start going wild and calculating. Uh, what happens to the fluctuations of many, many things? Okay, so, so if you ask what are the fluctuations of the NTK at the start of training? What are the fluctuations of the gradients of the network output with respect to the input at the start of training? What are the fluctuations of the, oops, gradient of the network output with respect to the trainable parameters at the start of training? Uh, what how much correlation do you have between different neurons? You know, if I take the ith neuron at x squared and the jth neuron at x prime squared, this is supposed to go to zero as n goes to infinity because i and j are different for me. Um, but okay, a finite width, it's non-zero. Okay, so, so when you start studying fluctuations and correlations, okay, all of these things scale like L over n, plus lower order terms of order n to the minus two, in which the dependence on L is presumably that they scale like L squared over n squared. But OK, you can check that, but then you'll get an, a, an error of order n to the minus three. And then presumably that scales like L cubed over n cubed. And you, you see, you can check it, but I don't know how to do the resummation as a physicist would say. I don't know how to say that all error terms depend only on L over n. So I'm just saying that leading order to uh, in one over n, everything, all the fluctuations of quantities you care about will grow like L over N. Okay, so, 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 so let me tell you what I think is a kind of exciting and concrete consequence of this. So, so what this says, if you just focus on this story here, that the fluctuations of the derivatives you actually use for optimization, you basically have to differentiate the model output with respect to the trainable parameters. Okay, so, so this is, when you have large fluctuations for that, you run into what's called the exploding and vanishing gradient problem. It's a famous problem in neural network optimization, which has largely been mitigated, but not always. And it's a historical thing that kind of drove a lot of practical innovation. So we, we get this nice characterization, at least in fully connected networks, that exploding and vanishing gradients happen if and only if the network depth divided by the width okay, uh, is big. Because the fluctuations scale like L over N if you have the network output. Okay, so, so um, and similarly, you have neurons are correlated, neuron correlations, if and only if L over N is big. Uh, okay, and, and so on and so forth. So, so, so somehow you get that in general, and this is the message I would say in some sense of maybe the whole talk, but certainly of this theorem at a large scale, is that the right way to measure, I claim, um, the actual effective depth of your neural network is not by measuring the apparent depth L, but rather the ratio of L and N. Okay, so, so I want to just promote this as a way of measuring the effective depth of the network. Uh, you know, this, this like I said, um, this controls the scale of fluctuations can, in fact, controls feature learning, uh, as I'll state in just a moment in the last theorem that I discuss. And, and, and kind of the, the motto that I, I tell myself is that depth amplifies finite width effects. That's how I interpret the fact that everything scales with L over N. So finite width effects are those that are suppressed like powers of one over M, like the fact that the NTK is about to change, like the fact that you're supposed to have correlated neurons, like the fact that you're not a Gaussian process. And in fact, they're not suppressed like one over N, they're suppressed like L over N. So, so, so as soon as L is at least moderately big, you know, even if L over N is 10 to the minus three, you already have a, a quantitative way of saying, I'm not close to a Gaussian process. I'm not close to a linear model and so on. Okay, so, so let me pause one more time. Um, I know there's a question that I will answer now. And then I want to take one more very brief theorem and I promise I will be done. 
So, so I'm curious what method is used to prove the result that the 11th cumulant um, gets treated. Maybe I'm missing some background. Yeah, so, so, so okay. The truth is I'm, I'm trying to cram many, many things into one talk and I've decided uh, against my own better judgment in some sense to jettison any mention of how things are proved. But, but what I would say is in retrospect, the reason to study the 11th cumulant is that you might've thought the 11th cumulant is not important. But actually I'm telling you, it is important if you care to study networks that are actually quite deep. All the cumulants are important. And, and so, so, so you really kind of can't get away from studying. Okay, that's, that's my best attempt to answer your question, which is very reasonable. Yeah, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, so, so, so let me state one last theorem and then I promise I will be done and I'll be very happy to take more questions um, or have a discussion if people have things that they want to chat about. So, so let me tell you the analog of the theorem about optimization at uh, finite width. Okay, so, so, so here I'm just, I'm going to state it and I'm going to assume that you know what the NTK is. So if you don't, I'll, I'll try to explain roughly what the heck I'm trying to say. So again, depending on, the result that comes from various different work. Okay, so, so, so the first thing is, let me say this, uh, if sigma is a special case is the ReLU, that's the most popular nonlinearity used in practice, then the expectation of the change in the gradient of the output with respect to the model. So this is the change in the first step of training. Okay, remember I told you that when we do optimization for these infinite width networks, all you have to do is take your original network and just linearize it and you keep the same Jacobi. But okay, all linear methods for optimization pretend for each step that the network is linear. They linearize the network. They take one step as if it's linear. But then of course, the trouble is you have to relinearize the model you have at the place you landed. And so, so the deviation from the lazy training regime or the NTK regime as it's called, one way to measure it is to ask how much does the Jacobian change? How much difference does it make to keep the old linearization you had at the starting point versus the new linearization that you find at the place where you land? Okay, so, so what I'm saying is for ReLU, you can do very exact calculations and you get that it scales up to certain constants like L over N, times the exponential of L over N. So you see that again, it's only the effect of network depth that's important. And in fact, when you do the resummation, which you can do for ReLU, things are exponential in L over N. Okay, so, so here, if you fix L and you send N to infinity, you indeed recover that the change in the Jacobian or the change in the NTK goes to zero. And that's because of this prefactor. But as soon as L over N is even moderately large, you know, this exponential is gonna take off. And so, so actually you get very, very rapid change, a lot of feature learning as soon as you have positive effective depth. Okay, so, so, so then trying to move beyond the ReLU results, which are proved by very ReLU specific methods. Okay, so for general sigma, uh, we don't have such a nice result, but what we can say is that this expected change grows like L over N plus O of N to the minus two with some unspecified dependence at the moment uh, on capital L. So, okay, we believe that the dependence is capital L over N quantity squared, but um, okay, in a physics -y way, we know how to prove that, that's in the book, and much more is in the book as I'm about to say, but in a mathematical way, I I'm not sure how to get these kind of things in a very systematic way yet. Okay, so, so, so but still, it's the effect of that, even for general sigma that controls how much feature learning is about to happen? How much does your model deviate from being a linear model? Okay, and, and then the last thing I want to do is I just want to give an advertisement for a part of the book, which I had no part in writing. So I'm going to attribute this specifically to Dan Roberts and Shoy Aida. Okay, they did a thing which I'm still shocked to this day is possible. But what they do is they obtain a formula that's recursive in capital L for a fully trained 
network. Okay, so they actually write a recursive formula uh, for what a network will predict after training to leading order in one over n. So to leading order in L over n plus corrections that look like O of L over n squared. Okay, so, so these recursions are painful and it's hard to solve them, but, but the fact that there's a formula at all is kind of crazy. Okay, and the basic idea is you say at infinite width, you can write down the solution to gradient descent. It's just a kernel regression problem. No one can stop you. And then what you do is you do perturbation theory directly for the end of training. That's the basic idea. And then, okay, all kinds of technical craziness ensues. And then if you are strong at doing calculations like they are, you can actually get the answer. Okay, so, so, so let me just sum up by saying what the message is of this theorem and in some sense, again, of the whole talk, that the deviation from the lazy training regime, from NTK regime, scales like L over N, it's determined by the effective network width. And, and therefore, you know, if you want to understand what kinds of networks, at least fully connected networks, are capable of doing feature learning, at least with the initialization scheme that we choose. There are other important schemes that are out there, which I'm just not mentioning at all. Okay, then, then feature learning, in other words, um, a situation in which you're not a linear model can happen if and only if L over N is positive. Okay, so you get a kind of nice criterion for feature learning. Uh, and, and let me just kind of compare this to well, okay, the exploding and vanishing gradient problem here. So you see uh, feature learning only happens when the effective depth is large. And in fact, you get more feature learning the more the effective depth grows. Okay, but if the effective depth grows too large, you're not numerically stable enough to actually train. You have numerically unstable gradients, the fluctuations of your gradients go wild. And so, so this suggests a kind of principled explanation for why neural networks that are successful are fairly deep, but also much wider than they tend to be deep. Okay, it, it's really, you need to keep the ratio uh, of the depth to the width, some moderate, and in fact, really not too large, but strictly positive number, strictly positive to be away from the linear regime and not too large because you need numerical stability for optimization to succeed. Okay, so, so that's the end of what I wanted to say. Let me pause. Um, and thank you for your attention. And then also, of course, take your questions. Okay, so, so I see there's already a question. Um, can I interpret your message as a sort of Heisenberg principle for networks? Um, Heisenberg principle. Well, I, I guess it's ironic because I'm somewhat uncertain about <laughs> what the question means. So maybe, maybe it was meant to be a meta joke. No, I'm kidding. You should clarify the what you mean, and I, I will try to engage with it in a serious way. Uh, yep, in the meantime, if anybody else um, has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourselves and ask. <clears throat> and um, I'd like to thank, thank the speaker also for, for a great talk. Thank you.